best practices used in the fight and movement to end FGM. This discussion will also highlight the commitments made under SDG 5 to end this practice by 2030 and aspiration six of the agenda 2063 of the African Union. As a reminder, this event is being recorded as you probably heard. Uh, if you have any issue regarding this, um, please let us know in the chat. We will have a panel discussion and then open the floor for uh, discussion and questions. You can use the chat box to ask your questions and our panelists will be happy to uh, carry the conversation on with you. So first of all, I am pleased to introduce Ms. Asata uh, MB Kamara, who is the co-founder of There Is No Limit Foundation to provide her opening remarks. Um, Asata is a professional with over a decade of program development and management, strategic planning, operations and relationship building experience in nonprofit, local government and private sector. She excels in helping turn ideas into actionable steps um, by creating robust operations and evaluation systems. While working in leadership and management positions, she developed and implemented successful programs that impacted the lives of over 35,000 individuals, mainly women and youth living in extreme poverty. So Ms. Kamara, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Caitlin, and uh, welcome everyone to our event focused on human rights approaches to ending female genital mutilation. I am Isata Kamara, and as Caitlin mentioned, I'm the co-founder of There Is No Limit Foundation, an international nonprofit organization focused on empowering people living in extreme poverty through economic and education opportunities and by eliminating barriers such as female genital mutilation. I want to thank our co-founder of this event, the Nala Feminist, uh, Feminist Collective, an African group of feminists focused on fostering, enabling, and mobilizing young people from Africa and the diaspora. And I'm a proud member of that group as well. I also want to thank the moderator and speakers who are joining us today. These are incredible colleagues and I look forward to a rich discussion. Now we know that none of the issues that we're facing in our current world can be remedied unless we put human rights and women and girls rights to their bodies first. This is overdue, it is necessary and we cannot continue to wait. Estimates suggest that 4.6 million girls are at risk of undergoing female genital mutilation each year in high prevalence countries like my native country, the Republic of Guinea, a country where nine in 10 women and girls have between the ages of 15 and 49 have been cut. And we know this number is likely even higher because this practice thrives in secrecy. We also know that it is higher because there are many countries and many communities that practice varying forms of female genital mutilation that are still not being counted in these statistics. At There Is No Limit Foundation, we work hard every day to protect the rights of people, especially those living in extreme poverty, many of them women and girls and people with disability. And for, and for more than a decade and a half, we have been at the forefront of raising awareness about the issues of female genital mutilation on the African continent and in the United States. We use the lens of human rights in our work because we know that female genital mutilation at its core is about protecting people's rights to their bodies, a right that is absolute. And through our Break the Silence campaign, we have trained more than 7,000 people about the dangers of female genital mutilation. Young people are at the heart of this work and we use art, community gatherings to foster dialogues in our communities. We, we also know that female genital mutilation is not an issue that concerns only women and girls. Everyone is affected. And so our outreach creates opportunities for all segments of the community to talk to each other and to create agreements about the best way to move forward. Our advocacy campaign has been robust and successful. More than 10 million people have been reached by our messages through documentaries, news segments, and other mediums. And we have pushed for more attention to the issue in the United States 
and we were integral in some of the US laws that were passed. And we've provided training to law enforcement, medical staff and students, as well as other stakeholders to ensure that our communities are properly served. Yet even with all of this work, we still need to do more. We, the global community, we, the people of this world. We need to do more because even though all countries have agreed to end female genital mutilation by 2030, as part of the Sustainable Development Goals 5, the political will and the follow through is lacking. We need to do more because COVID-19 has impacted the progress that were made previously. And we need to do more because women and girls' lives are equally valuable. We just need to do more. And I know that we can do more. We can do more if we have the will and if we collaborate together. And so I look forward to this discussion and I thank you for listening and I hand it back to Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asata. That was uh, very powerful. And uh, so thank you for, for sharing that. Um, next, we will hear opening remarks from Ms. Aya Chebe, who unfortunately couldn't attend due to other commitments, um, but she did record a video for us to play. Um, and Ms. Aya is the founder and chair of NALA Feminist Collective and the executive director of Afrosist. She's a multi-award winning pan-African feminist. She rose to prominence as a voice for democracy and shot to global fame as a political blogger during the 2010-2011 Tunisia's revolution. She served as the first ever African Union Special Envoy. Okay, I got some echo, but I think we're good now. Um, uh, she served as the first ever African Union Special Envoy on Youth and the youngest diplomat at the African Union Commission Chairperson's Cabinet um, between 2018 and 2021. She received the Gates Campaign Award and was named in Forbes Africa's 50 Most Powerful Women, New African Magazine list of 100 Most Influential Africans, and the top 20 list of Apolitical 100, the world's most influential young people in government. Um, so we will now play her opening remarks. Welcome CSW family. It's an honor to collaborate with There Is No Limit Foundation again, and this time around this important two weeks of CSW 66 under the priority theme of achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. Our event today on human rights approach to ending female genital mutilation is a critical discussion about the best practices in the fight and movement to end FGM on how we can break the silence on FGM and leverage the resources and partnerships we have and that we can forge. For this to happen, our movement needs to be intergenerational, intersectional and Pan-African. As Nala Feminist Collective, we have said it at the African Young Women Beijing Plus 25 Manifesto that FGM is violence. Demand two of the manifesto is about the criminalization of the epidemic of gender-based violence in all its forms, especially in conflict, displacement, and humanitarian settings, including femicide, rape, harmful practices, female genital mutilation, girl, child, and forced marriage, sexual abuse, sexual harassment, trafficking, domestic and economic abuse, and all other forms of exploitation. This manifesto demand, which was signed by over 10,000 feminists, also requires the fund allocation and support of youth innovation and research to tackle GBV. So to our partners, to what extent are you willing to fund those of us who are organizing in unconventional ways and challenging power dynamics and the status quo to end FGM? We need to also take this opportunity at CSW 66 to remind the United Nations of two important things. One, is that Generation Equality Forum has only started after Paris and not ended there. After we launched Nala Femme at Paris Forum last year, we organized six intergenerational accountability forums and dialogues on Jeff in the six African countries leading the action coalitions, namely Tunisia, Malawi, Rwanda, Kenya, Burkina Faso, and South Africa. Many of those countries have made commitments to end FGM, have made financial commitments on GBV, 
And we have great concern as a collective that political commitments are not followed by action. These are commitments aligned with SDG 5 of Agenda 2030 and the Aspiration 6 of Agenda 2063. We're not asking for a favor. We're demanding what you signed up for as member states of the United Nations and African Union. Two, that civil society voices are paramount to CSW. And the next one should have civil society access to UN building to convene, to organize, to advocate, to speak to policymakers. It has become a hustle for young feminist movements to survive during this pandemic. Hustle for protection, hustle for funding, hustle to access government and the United Nations, hustle to participate, to have a seat at the table. And even this hustle is romanticized. So our call to action is make CSW young feminist led and you will see the results. Thank you colleagues from There Is No Limit Foundation, especially my sister Aisata and our NALA council member and her team. And also to my sister Olo, NALA council member, who will be participating in the discussion and sharing her incredible work in Nigeria. Thank you to all panelists and partners for joining us in demanding to end FGM now. As NALA Feminist Collective, we will continue to break the silence with you. Thank you so much, Aya. Uh, so now we'll move to our panel discussion. Um, today we have with us Ms. Oluwashan Ayodeji Oshawobi, uh, Council Member at NALA Feminist Collective, and Ms. Casey Swegman, uh, Director of Public Policy at the Tahere Justice Center. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, like you to tell us about yourself and the work that you're doing with your organization and the, the networks that you're part of. Um, so we'll start with you, Olu. Hi, thank you so much, um, Kathleen, and thanks to Aya and Aisata for the invitation to be here. My name is Olua Sheo Ayodeji Ushawabi. I'm Nigerian, based in Nigeria, um, the executive director of Stand to End Rape Initiatives there, which is a youth-led organization in Nigeria advancing gender equality and also advocating to eliminate all forms of sexual and gender based violence against men and girls. Um, I've been working within the civil society space for about eight years and I've been um, developing strategies and policies with government and other civil society organizations around women's rights, safety and well-being within the country, um, but importantly also enabling women to advocate for their own rights and receive support when um, they unfortunately experience any form of sexual or gender based violence in Nigeria. I am also a member of the Feminist Coalition in Nigeria, which is a, um, a group of young feminists advancing women's rights. Um, I'm part of the State of Emergency GBV in Nigeria and, and also a council member for NALA Feminist Collective. And for those who don't know, for those who don't know who we are, I'm always excited to talk about us. Um, we're a Pan-African group of 17 feminists um, with a mission to foster, enable, and mobilize young um, women from Africa and the diaspora. Um, while bridging the gap between policy and implementation at intergovernmental and grassroots level, as well as generational spaces. Um, our work is guided by the African Young uh, Women Beijing Plus 25 Manifesto, which is a groundbreaking feminist political document of 10 political demands. And I'm excited to you know, talk about one of those demands today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for having me as well. I just want to say, first of all, it's just incredible to be here in this virtual space with all of you and Isada in particular. It's just really wonderful to see your face after so long during the pandemic. Um, and there's just a lot of wisdom in this space. And it's a really huge privilege for me to, to be here and alongside all of you today. So thank you for putting this together. Um, as some of you might know, the Tahere Justice Center, which is based in Washington, D.C., was founded by our CEO after a groundbreaking case um, that she was involved in with Thousia Kasinja, who was seeking asylum in the US from FGMC and forced marriage. Um, and I have worked at Tahere for about nine years on specifically our project focusing on forced marriage as it's happening in the United States. Um, and some of the most rewarding work that I've done in that space has been serving survivors all across our country and those that are taken abroad. And Beyond that, working on the state and federal level to change policies that can better protect and serve survivors, 
in the United States. And we did get a big win on that front recently with the passage of the Violence Against Women Act, defining forced marriage as a form of harm that is present in the United States for the very first time. And a few other little pieces of text that we were very excited to see. Um, the other really exciting part of my job is facilitating the Forced Marriage Working Group, which is a national working group of community-based organizations in conversation and dialogue and in a community of practice with larger national coalitions focused on domestic violence and sexual assault, talking about best practices when serving survivors and policy changes that are needed. And I also represent Tahere on the US chapter of Girls Not Brides. So thanks again for having me and I'm really excited for this conversation today. Thank you both. Um, and Olu, as you mentioned, you're doing incredible work uh, in Africa, particularly in Nigeria. Um, could you tell us about the progress made on the African continent regarding the fight against FGM and, and what is still lacking? In your opinion, what are, what are some of the challenges? Thank you very much for your question. So I started working on FGM issues around 2015 when I had gone into a local um, community and I you know, met with survivors of FGM and they shared their experience with me. And it was really daunting about, you know, um, the ripple effects that FGM has on girls. And so I started working with UNFP at the time as a consultant going into communities to engage um, stakeholders, especially those who um, practice FGM. And one of the key things that I realized is there was a, a bit of knowledge gap because to them, they were doing girls a favor by cutting them and making them prepared for marriage, um, preventing them from getting into quote and unquote prostitution and, you know, so many misconceptions that they had. Um, there's even a health misconception that when the head of a baby touches the clitoris, the baby, you know, tends to die. So in their opinion, they're doing the, key, um, the girls a favor by practicing FGM. And so the interesting thing about that project was I was able to, you know, talk about the health challenges right that comes out of practicing fgm and when they heard from myself and you know other people and even from survivors themselves because they're the best people to tell their own stories you know they began to question their practices and you know you know try to understand how to do things better and from that engagement about three communities actually outrightly abandoned the practice so imagine one effort in one community spiraling into three communities and then different individuals across Africa, you know, leading such initiatives. So of course we're making progress and I can speak to the work of two of my um, Nala Femme sisters, um, Jaha Dekora, who is from the um, Safe Hands for Girls working in um, working on ending FGM, as well as Aisha to herself, you know, these two feminists are working in different countries, um, both nationally, um, regionally and globally. And so we can see that there's a bit of progress um, in activism. I'd also talk about policy. Um, in Nigeria, we have the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, which is not a law that has been passed at a national level. And about um, 25 states, um, as of now, have adopted it at the local level. So we can see that there are laws in place to decriminalize um, um, FGM. And I want to you know, highlight Egypt, for instance. Um, in March 2021, the Senate in Egypt actually condemned you know, FGM and amended some provisions of the penal code, especially uh, number 58 of the 97 penal code, sort of tightening the punishment for those who practice FGM. Um, and FGM in terms of you know, full removal or even partial um, removal of um, a, female, um, a female's genitals, either by modifying it, mutilating, inflicting injury, whatever it is, ensuring that they actually serve a penalty of no less than five years. Um, so we can see that in terms of policy and you know um, advocacy, there's a bit of progress being made. We also have um, you know the agenda 2063 of the African Union, you know which calls for for the total elimination and you know um, abandonment of every practice that is against women's bodily autonomy, especially um, sexual and gender based violence, which FGM falls under. Um, so I, I can say that we're making a lot of progress in terms of awareness. You know, people are more aware of how their actions and inactions contribute to FGM and, you know, um, the need to abandon the practice because it has no health benefit, no social benefit. Rather, it causes more health constraints and challenges, you know, to, to women's, women's health. 
Nonetheless, um, we still haven't you know, achieved as much as we should because more than 200 million girls um, and women alive today, you know, I've undergone FGM in 30 countries in Africa. Um, that for me is a daunting, you know, statistics to, to think about like, oh my God, you know, we have 200 million girls who have been mutilated. That's, that's generations upon generations who have experienced violence, you know, um, against their bodies and, and, and rights. Um, we still have, you know, treatment of, you know, health complications for FGM, you know, being prevalent in 27 countries and it costs about 1.4 billion USD per year. And there's a projection that is going to rise to 2.3 billion in 2047 if no action is taken. So the resources we're supposed to invest into girls' education, safe spaces, um, you know, access to health um, services, we're rather using that to make corrections and to deal with the you know health complications that arise from FGMC. So in essence, we are making progress, but we're still having to spend money. We're still, you know, seeing cases of women being violated, right? Um, and we're not making as much progress as I would love us to make, um, you know, um, in Africa. So I would say that we're doing well, we're making progress, but there's still so much that can be done. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. And I really appreciated what you said about th this ripple effect, right, of FGM. Um, and we we know that forced child marriage is, is part of that ripple as well, right? And so, Casey, can you talk to us about the intersectionality between FGM and early and forced child marriage in your work at Tahereh Justice Cent Center? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm happy to follow on that. I think you know, I'm just going to start by grounding us all in the definition of forced marriage that, that we're using. So we're coming at this sort of from the same conceptualization, but um, forced marriage is defined now in the Violence Against Women Act as a marriage in which one or both people do not or cannot consent and often involves one or more elements of force, fraud, or coercion. And it's not the same as arranged marriage in which family members might play a role in finding a match, but the ultimate choice to consent to whether to marry at all, when to marry, and who to marry remains with the individuals. And so, you know, what we've seen in our work is that not all individuals, children or adults, who face the threat of forced marriage are also at risk of FGMC, but FGMC and forced marriage, you know, forced marriage can really at times both necessitate and guarantee FGMC in certain communities and forced marriage survivors who come forward may have experienced FGMC in their lifetime that was never tended to. And so we believe a lot of this is driven by the fact that, you know, as has already been stated, in many contexts, FGMC is considered necessary to prepare a girl for marriage and is related to that concept of marriageability. Um, and for me, you know, the reason it's so important to name this intersection is so that those of us in a position to provide services or support or interfacing with survivors who disclose either being at risk of FGMC or having undergone FGMC are also screened for forced marriage and vice versa, survivors and individuals at risk who are coming forward saying they're facing the threat of forced marriage or were forced into marriage are screened for FGMC because they might have many physical, mental health issues that have never been tended to, never been told they could have support for those issues that they may never even have known what the root cause of them were. Um, and especially that finding community around the psychological damage and those community ripple effects is really so important. And you have this moment, this really unique opportunity as a service provider or an ally to a survivor to say, you know, I'm really grateful that you disclosed this to me. I want to make sure that we are holistically responding to what you need and what you might have experienced and your potential lifetime experiences with trauma and how that's impacted you and your family and your community. And so I think recognizing and naming that link is really important, first and foremost, to making sure we're serving survivors the best way that we can and that we're working in community as policy advocates um, when we're working on policy changes that can respond to both and, and be in solidarity with one another. Thank you for sharing that, Casey. And, and I particularly like that last part that you shared, because I've always believed, you know, the, the 
more that we can work together, the better it is for all of us. Um, and especially when, you know, our the work that we're doing intersects so much as you outlined. So thank you. Um, moving back to you, Oli, in terms of advocacy work, how can we leverage the efforts in raising awareness among young women and girls? Okay, so um, I mentioned earlier that the um, Banana Feminist Collective is demanding um, 10 things, right, um, based on the manifesto. And when it comes to criminalizing gender-based violence, we're asking that, you know, we end it in all its forms. So whether it is in conflicts, displacement, humanitarian settings, including femicide, rape, harmful traditional practices, FGM, um, forced marriage, you know, um, sexual harassment and things. And so when you have young feminists who are already leading, you know, this conversation, what can be done is to sort of expand on the conversation, right? Um, you know, people in their own different corners or, you know, um, communities can hold conversations with those in power. They can hold conversations with, um, you know, gatekeepers, for instance, you know, challenging um, the, the, the gender dynamics, you know, and, and, and the um, discrimination that women face when, when they have to undergo this very harmful traditional practice. So I think that's one of the things that can, you know, that can be done. Another thing that can be done is um, including sexual productive health and rights, and body autonomy in educational curricula at early stages. And I'll use Nigeria as an example. Um, at some point, you couldn't teach things around uh, condoms or um, you couldn't mention sex, for instance, in secondary schools. And what we then realized is, you know, young people, adolescents um, in school and even some out of school tend to pick information from their peers. And most of this information is wrong. Um, so I think it's important that we incorporate, you know, people um, bodily autonomy and, you know, um, the need to end FGM into our curricula so that even girls from a young age um, are aware because I'm speaking now in terms of girls who would grow up to become mothers themselves, right? Um, and we give, give birth to girls. Um, they're able to, you know, articulate better. They're able to negotiate to say, you know what, my child will not undergo this practice because it is not beneficial. Um, but when girls, you know, from adolescent do not even understand, you know, what FGM is, um, you know, as, as, as young people, they're not really able to, you know, negotiate when they grow, grow older. And it's also particularly important for them because um, it's not every girl who undergoes it before the age of, uh, of five, for instance. Some actually undergo it at the age of 13, 14. For those kind of girls, when we're able to teach them comprehensive sexuality education, they're able to know what their rights are and, you know, can speak for themselves, you know, um, and, you know, get advocates or, or teachers to also speak on their behalf to negotiate with their parents. So I, I really believe in, you know, empowering young people themselves, um, adolescents especially, to understand what FGMC is, even boys, right? Boys can speak up for their sisters. They can speak up, you know, for girls in their communities, for girls in their areas. It doesn't just have to be the girls themselves. We also have to engage boys as, as active advocates who can also speak up um, um, against this, this um, human rights violation. Um, the final thing I'd like to mention is in terms of um, financial funding to women and feminist organizations and individuals, to be honest, who are working at the grassroots level to raise awareness, to influence policies, to provide support services. Um, because what I what I I have realized is majority of these feminist organizations lack a lot of funding, um, they lack a lot of capacity building, and this is not to say that they don't have capacity; they do. But there's always, you know, room for improving on capacity for those who, for instance, are very good with grassroots mobilization. You can be their capacities to involve themselves in policy advocacy, right? You know, um, where they can bring practical on-ground experience to policy. And I'll tell you why this is important. When we were trying to pass the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act in Nigeria, it took about 13 years to get that policy passed because the men, in power just could not understand why women wanted their rights to be well protected. So it took young activists like myself and majority of my other sisters and even men who have understanding of how violence happens at the grassroots level and its impact on women and girls to go for public hearing, to write memos, you know, to lead protests to say, you are not listening to us, right? You don't understand 
the problem as much as we do. These are the problems, and this is the benefit of you passing or you know um, implementing this policy. So we were able to get that policy passed in 2014, and it was signed into law in 2015. So you can imagine, you know, being able to provide capacity and funding and platforms for young feminist and women-led organizations to really demand, you know, um, policy change not just at the grassroots level in terms of social norms, but also at the national level. So those, those would be my contribution, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And that's such a great segue to the next question, right? Um, particularly what you're sharing about, you know, the challenges of getting policy passed and these men in power not knowing about these issues and, you know, being the barrier, right? And so, and I believe that as part of the advocacy work, that accountability aspect is crucial as well. Um, so maybe Casey, if you could tell us more about the efforts to be taken and the best practices in holding the government accountable uh, regarding the commitment to end FGM. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as many of you know, we in the United States do have a federal crime against FGMC. And as of October of last year, the majority of our states have passed legislation also making it a crime. That said, there have been very few prosecutions. And you can have an entirely different session on the pros and cons of criminalization. And I'm certainly not the right voice to be centered in that conversation. But what I will say is that survivors should have the ability to access any option that they want or that they need in order to achieve safety and justice on their own terms. And when they come forward to claim their rights, they should be believed. I will also say that civil protection orders, um, and we've seen more of this used more effectively in the UK, they have both a protection order to prevent FGMC and a protection order to prevent forced marriage. And they, they have been utilized effectively. And they can be incredibly empowering prevention tools. They're civil, not criminal. Um, you can invoke the system to protect you without invoking criminal penalties against your family especially for vulnerable immigrant families in the United States, that can be really key to survivors' comfort coming forward. Um, but quite frankly, I think we all know that civil and criminal laws are just not enough. And while Isada, you know, already named that on their own, they won't do very much if we don't have the backup um, and the robust funding and support for programs that support individuals at risk and survivors, provide the services that can cater to their emotional, their psychological, their spiritual health, their physical health and their safety needs that then allows them to step into that role as, a, as an advocate. Because we know that coming forward, sharing your story, stepping into policy spaces where there are lots of sharp elbows, lots of men, and quite frankly, some women and others who don't understand this issue, who don't take a human rights approach, we need to support those survivors who are doing that work. If we're welcoming them into policy spaces, they need the support to make that sustainable and to reduce the harm that they encounter when they're doing that policy advocacy work. And I think we also need to support and recognize what folks have already said is that those advocates that are working within their own communities to do that long work of shifting beliefs and behaviors so that the practice is abandoned once and for all and that we're attacking it at its root that work needs to be recognized as equally valuable as advocating for policy change on the federal level. We need the backup to those policy changes. It's, it's not enough to just name something as a crime. We need to back up that posture with the necessary funding and the recognition of all of this work and all of these programs and survivor advocates to come forward and say what they need and that these systems should be working better. Don't just make proclamations in Paris. Don't just change the law but really have our backs. And I think it's an entire ecosystem um, of response that's really required and governments can't just stop at those public commitments. We need, we need everyone in this fight and we need everyone, the value of everyone's work to be equal. And we need that robust funding across the board. Thank you both. I've I've heard both of you talk about, you know, the importance of really lifting up the work of the, the folks who are doing the work on the ground, right? These grassroots, these feminist organizers, um, and also the importance of funding as well, which I think everyone here can really relate to. Um, so thank you both Olu and Casey um, for your this very insightful conversation. Um, we'll, we will now move to our Q&A session. Um, so for um, 
for you all, please write any questions that you have in the chat. I've seen a couple come in already. Um, and so the, the first question, um, Olu, I think this one would be more um, for you. What alternatives are we offering communities that can adequately stop the cutting of girls? So I don't, I sh that's a good question. Thanks for asking. I don't think we need to offer an alternative. It's, it's like offering a rapist an alternative to violating a woman's body, right? Um, what it is, is you let them know, and which is what we do, right? It's maybe the alternative is education, right? Grassroots education or, you know, informal education to let, help them understand that well. When you don't cut girls, right? They don't have compl complications during childbirth. And it means they don't, you know, they're not at risk of maternal mortality through FGM, right? When you don't cut girls, um, you know, and they stay in school, you enable them to get not just an education, but, you know, to, to, to better their future, right? To contribute back to the community and, you know, support their family. That is, those, those are vital things, right? So I don't, it's, it's not like um, a negotiation for, you know, can you please do this for us and take this in return? It's about, well, you are committing a crime, you are, you know, violating our bodies, the bodies of, you know, girls, and it has to stop. And these are the reasons why it has to stop. And these are the benefits, you know, when you stop it. So maybe that's the alternative that we are offering them. And of course, the law is the law. The law criminalizes it, right? So I don't need to offer you, you know, an alternative alternative not to commit crime you commit a crime you go to jail it's your choice uh, but i believe in attitudinal change you know building people's knowledge changing their attitudes and influencing their practices right and so i really you know um, leverage community engagement and just educating people to help them know better you know because i always there's always room for that um so that's the kind of alternative that we are currently um, offering. And one thing that we do, maybe also a good alternative, is when a community abandons um, FGM, we promote them. You know, we, we talk about them. We say, you know, these are champions for women's rights. You know, we'll put them in the positive light. And that makes them feel good, I believe, you know, um, and also maybe encourages other people and views like a healthy competition amongst other communities as well. So when they abandon FGM, more programs come into their communities, right? Because they are supporting women's safety and well-being. So maybe that's the alternative that we kind of offer them, but not really target alternative. I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you so much. And I think the next question is, is for you as well. Um, do you find when most uh, people from places practicing FGM, when they first become aware of the harm that it causes, do they stop the practice right then? Or is it really only after repeated messaging that you see a stop in this practice? It depends on the community and uh, their religious belief as well, um, as well as their you know, social belief. Um, because I've been to communities where we only went that one time and they immediately understood the effect and said, you know what, this does not make sense, right? We're causing more harm than good to our girls. So we're going to abandon it immediately. Whereas other required consistent and advocacy and engagement, helping them understand, you know, um, why they needed to abandon it. So it's not like a um, one solution fits all. It depends on the context of the community and, you know, what you find on, um, on the ground. For some people, you know, they abandon it immediately. For some other people, you have to continue to engage them, you know, um, month in, week in, week out, helping them understand, you know, the different vices um, um, of, of FGM and, you know, their practice. And, you know, using examples of other communities who have abandoned the practice as, you know, um, a soft ground, right? To say, you know what, look at your mates, for lack of a better word, you know, see your mates, they're doing good, you know, they've abandoned it. And their girls are living a healthier life, you know, they have more programs and, you know, funding in their, in their community, you know, wouldn't you want to be like that? You know, so it just takes um, understanding the context of the community you're engaging. And um, yeah, the results will differ, but the eventual result is for them to abandon the practice. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, this next question, um, 
I I think would be for you, Casey. Um, but Olu, if you have more to add, um, please feel free. But how many criminal charges have there been in the U.S. against FGM? And Caitlin, I'm sure you could probably answer this one too. Um, but you know, I think there have been. There was a successful prosecution in Georgia, actually, before the state of Georgia had a specific law against FGMC, but someone who had done it to a child was charged with aggravated battery and cruelty to children. So that prosecution was not, the named crime was not FGMC, but it was the FGMC that brought him before the court. I think a lot of us are aware of what happened in 2017 with the case of Jumana, and uh, who was a doctor who was found to be um, who was accused of performing FGMC on children uh, in the state of Michigan. And unfortunately, that prosecution actually ended up falling apart. And that is why putting faith in the criminal justice system isn't always, um, you can't always predict the outcome. Um, I think the movement has since recovered from that. Um, a judge ruled the law unconstitutional. We have since fixed that, um, much to you know, the credit of other folks on this call. Um, and there, in 2021, there was another person uh, charged actually at the federal level. Um, and so there, there, those are the cases that I'm aware of. Um, as I said, it is not a large number. Uh, I think it's even hard to study this issue in the United States. A lot of researchers have noted that. We rely heavily on international research because the practice in the U.S. is so secretive and those dynamics of vacation cutting make it very hard to detect and very hard to study. And, and certainly. Um, given the dynamics of our criminal justice system and how the criminal justice system is interwoven with our immigration laws, it can really cause a chilling effect for survivors to feel safe to come forward, given all the pressures that are bearing down on them and their communities and their families. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I see a uh, hand raised, um, Costly, um, if you wanna um, unmute and you feel free to ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I'm so excited to be part of this conversation. I well, thank, I just want to say well done to all the feminists that came together to you know to put this together. Um, I'm particularly delighted to listen to my sister from Nigeria, Ayade Jishobi. Um, and this topic is very interesting because when you look at the history of FGM. There was a time, the only reason why we were telling people to hand FGM was because of the health issues that comes with FGM. You know, we were doing all of this in communities and we found out that people saw that, oh, if you're telling us that because of the health complications, you don't want us to practice this again. What if we go to the hospital and do it in a way that it doesn't come with complications? What if we get expert doctors, nurses, we perform this on our daughters and we can escape some of these complications. No, not until when the human rights approach was introduced into the fight against the FGM. That was when we started getting results. Oh no, this is not just about a complication. It's about the human rights of girls and women that are being violated every day. So this is a very interesting topic and human rights lens has really brought in a lot of results for the work we do at the grassroots and getting uh, more support at the global level to say that oh, a violation of one person's human rights is a violation of everybody's human rights. We need to stand up for this and we need to speak against this. So um, this is very interesting. Like my sister said, the law is the law. It's against the law. It's a human rights violation. And so when you violate it, you have to go to jail. I'm excited to tell us that in Nigeria, we are presently prosecuting the first case of FGM. I mean, we've done a lot of work. We know that it's been done every day. But um, for the first time, because of social media, we're able to hear about a particular case and we are really on it. We can't wait for perpetrators to face judgment. And then that will serve as deterrence to other people that the law is the law. You cannot continue to violate the right of women and girls every day and walk freely as if nothing is happening. So thank you very much um, for allowing me to speak. Over to you, Ethan. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so another question um, that um, we have is, and Casey, maybe this is for you. Um, 
What would your recommendations be to bridge the gap between policy and implementation in regards to ending FGM? Oh man, I mean, that is that is an issue across the board in the United States with lots of issues. And I think, you know, we're seeing a little bit of that right now. I want to give credit where credit is due. We're seeing some funding come down to, like, as Isada was sharing, you know, oftentimes we are provided funding to train police officers or others who respond to cases of child abuse and neglect uh, and other service providers that may interact with women and girls who have faced FGMC to know how to spot the signs, how best to react and respond and to understand the laws that are in place to protect against this practice. I think we are really just at the starting point there. And I think the amount of funding that we're getting and the amount of buy-in from those systems that we're receiving is still much lower than it needs to be. And I think it's both about being supported with the resources and the tools to do that outreach and education work and build those relationships. Um, but it's also about the buy-in of those systems themselves. We need to, we need to do better to be able to just raise awareness amongst the US population that this is happening. Um, and that we need to believe survivors and individuals at risk when they come forward. And, and that takes training and that takes awareness raising and that also needs to center survivors and that's long work. Um, and I think we are seeing some funding streams more regularly being made available um, and more opportunities uh, that the federal government and state governments are naming. You know, we need people to be trained on this issue and we have expert organizations in our state in order to do that. And so let's build those connections Let's support that work and make sure that it's long-term and it centers those most impacted. Um, but we have a long way to go. And I think it just means the drumbeat, we just need to keep it up. And when advocates who have been in this work a long time need to step back, we need new advocates and new voices to have space to step forward so that we never lose that thread. And we don't just have you know one good year for this work and then it fades into the background, but that we continue that drumbeat until we have really ended the practice once and for all. Yeah, absolutely. And Olu, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, what I would say is that when it comes to policy advocacy and implementation, um, just like the, the other panelists talked about, I think it's also about training those who will interpret the law, right? Um, because what, what we've realized is when people, when laws are passed, it doesn't automatically mean that those would implement it are aware of it or know how to use it so what i always advise donors or organizations to do is really train those who would in interpret what the law says and also be the capacities of civil society organizations and even healthcare systems um, and I, I love the fact that you know costly brought that up in in our contribution the healthcare system is very very critical in the um fights to eliminate fgmt because they are actually um, nurses and community health extension workers who actually practice FGM, right? Um, and so there has to be targeted advocacy and capacity building to those people to understand this is what the policy says, this is the, um, the benefit of eliminating um, um, FGMC when someone presents themselves to you in, in a health facility, you are mandated to make a report to the, to the um, to the medical director or the police, whatever is applicable in that context. So I really feel that um, achieving implementation is highly dependent on being the capacities and the knowledge of those who interpret the law, you know, to understand what it is and how to, how to use it. Yeah. Great, thank you both. Um, and I think, um, possibly the, the last question um, that I thought to, Posed, um, and I'd love to hear from both of you, is um, what innovations are you seeing in our work and what are new emerging solutions? Um, so Casey, maybe if you want to start and then Olu, if you want to share afterwards. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I would like to see more of, and I know that there are organizations in the U.S. doing this um, on shoestring budgets again and with lots of volunteers, um, there's Global Women's Peace Foundation that is very close to where I work in Washington, D.C., that runs summer camps every year for young girls from communities where FGMC is practiced. And a lot of um, what was mentioned earlier, you know, talking about 
talking about healthy relationships, talking about gender and sex, and really embedding those conversations early into girls' lives so that they understand their right to bodily autonomy and they understand their bodies in general. Um, and I love that work. And I think it's really powerful for those folks who are able to participate and wish it could be expanded. And I think that kind of community-based work, um, there's another group, Sauti Yetu in New York, who has been working on this for years in community with the West African diaspora um, community in, in the New York area. And again, that's really community-based, it's conversational. Um, it's again, you know, about healthy relationships and they talk about sex and they talk about gender and they talk about health and they talk about cultural practices. And that conversation around, you know, what cultural practices are really important and beautiful and valuable to me and what cultural practices might have reached their expiration date for me and my generation. And how do we claim that for ourselves? How do we call in our communities without calling them out? Because I think, you know, as Olu has mentioned, it's about celebrating when people do the right thing as much as it is punishing and calling out when people do the wrong thing. Um, and that's the kind of work that I'd really like to see be able to expand here. You know, we've got a lot of laws, we've got a lot of proclamations, but I know of a lot of folks who are working day in and day out um, who need more support and who need to be, quite frankly, as women, reimbursed in the right way for the work that they are doing and have that work recognized, just plain and simple. Okay, so um, I absolutely agree with Cassie. Um, and the only thing I would add is the fact that I want to see more, and I'm always very careful so it doesn't seem like tokenism, but I want to see more um, survival-led initiatives um, and organizations really using and leveraging storytelling um, and policy advocacy and also community engagement to really move the needle. Um, because I've noticed that there is power when survivors themselves are at the forefront of the issues, right? They are able to articulate the problems and challenges, you know, maybe better than, you know, those um, who haven't experienced it. And it's not to say that those who haven't experienced it doesn't, I'm sorry, don't have as much knowledge and capacity as survivors do. But there's something about storytelling. Um, and I'm using my background in sexual violence for this because we use storytelling to make rape a national issue, right? Um, there were, you know, ongoing efforts for policy advocacy, all of those things were great. But until survivors began to, you know, raise these conversations and have this very tough conversations, um, you know, in religious settings, churches, mosques, um, communities, you know, that's when we're seeing, you know, improvement and change and um, increased awareness and, uh, you know, all of the things that have happened, you know, um, today. So I'd like to see more um, survival-led initiatives and storytellers, you know, leveraging different forms, you know, arts, um, for instance, in, and this is not really just FGMC, but in 2017, we had an exhibition on the rights of LGBTIQ persons in Nigeria um, and how it relates to violence because there's things like corrective rape and you know, um, lynching and things like that. And from that you know, exhibition, people saw them as humans first before their judgmental you know, um, um, selves you know, came into play that, oh, the person is gay. But first you saw the human for who they are and you, you acknowledge the fact that they deserve to exist and not be violated and not be harassed or you know, raped and things like that. So it's really leveraging different creative ways to speak to people's conscience um, because we can have policies at the national level. But what you really want to achieve is social and behavioral change. You know, one person deciding to say, you know what, my family will not practice this and then will speak up for, you know, their sister's daughter or someone in their community. It just takes one person to create that, you know, um, that change. So for me, I want to see more storytelling, initiat storytelling initiatives. And just to talk about one, one, one of the comments in, in the comment section. Um, I absolutely agree that um, intersex people are, are mutilated, right? Because um, when they're trying to fit, fit them into one gender, you either you're a man or you're a woman. So if you have two genitalia, one has to be cut off. Um, and over time, we were not having that conversation, right? Um, up until, you know, the LGBTIQ movement, 
you know, started in Nigeria and intersex people started speaking up. So I do feel like there's a lot more advocacy that should be geared towards that area because it's a new space that, you know, um, some of us were not aware of about seven years ago, for instance, but, you know, thanks to activists and, you know, intersex people themselves who are bringing this issue to the forefront. And I think we need to continue to do that. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Thank, thank you both. Um, I, saw, I saw you had your hand raised a moment ago, so I wanna um, hand it over to you as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Olu, and thank you, Casey, for um, all the work that you've done. I also wanted to add in uh, my voice when it comes to the questions that were being raised in the chat um, related to the LGBTQI um, community and then the impact of female genital mutilation on those communities, as well as the potential um, discussions that are happening around uh, so male circumcision and all of that. So the first thing that I will say is that when it comes to female genital mutilation, this is a space that is increasingly growing and new voices are coming into it. So when it comes to the LGBTQIA uh, community and the impact of female genital mutilation on it, there's still more research that needs to be done. And so we encourage for more research, we encourage for more people to be able to speak to their own experiences. And with that, I want to acknowledge Renee uh, in this room uh, and other survivors that may be in this room. Thank you for being here and thank you for all the work that you do. Because again, unless we tell our own stories, oftentimes we're allowing other people to tell it for us. So that's the first thing that I will say. And then when it comes to um, the work and the different intersectionalities, we have to understand that as advocates and as people that are working on these issues, when there is a platform, um, we really have to be able to respect that platform and to be able to allow for those voices to also be heard, right? So if we are going into a platform that is designated, for example, for victims of sexual assault, when we are there, yes, we want to bring up the issues of female genital mutilation, but we also want to make sure that those voices that are in that space that we respect those voices and that we allow them to have the space to talk about the issues that brought us there at the beginning and to also then at a later point come in and say, hey, in addition to everything that has been said, I'd also like to bring your attention to X, Y, and Z. And then to identify opportunities for collaboration from there. Um, but I really think that sometimes when we're speaking to one issue or another um, in these platforms, we might sometimes feel the need to quote unquote hijack it because maybe our burning desire for our particular issue um, trumps what we might think others are feeling, but please, always be respectful of spaces that you get into and always know that there is always a moment to be able to have those conversations around collaboration. And that is something that I personally, as an activist fight for and something that I welcome. So again, let's all work together to do more research on what is happening related to female genital mutilation and frankly, all other issues, right? as it relates to the LGBTQIA uh, communities, because again, new, new voices, new information being learned, and the more we learn, the better we'll be able to actually end this practice. So uh, I wanted to address that, and I wanted to really acknowledge all survivors that are in this space. And I want to thank you, Caitlin, for the amazing work that you have done as a moderator for this event. You have been really, really incredible. and so gracious so thank you casey you already know that i admire you so much and i think that the Hiri and all the work that you all do there is amazing there's no limit foundation we're proud to be with you in the working group to end um force and uh, early marriage and we really look forward to continuing that work sister olu i really really um, i'm in awe of the work that you do Thank you, thank you for your voice. Thank you for taking the space. And I look forward to getting to know you even more as part of NALA um, and the amazing and incredible work that you do. And I hope that we'll be able to really collaborate with one another um, and to identify ways that you're in Nigeria, we're in Guinea, how can we do more together? The message is clear, guys. Um, we have to create strong policies. 
we have to strengthen collaboration across the different in intersectionalities that I have been just mentioning. And we have to invest in our communities. Communities know what solutions are and they know what solutions are going to work for them and what solutions are not going to work for them. So we have to fund them and we have to support all programming that centers around them. And with that in mind, I want to thank the Wallace Global Fund and Susan Gibbs for the support that they provide to a lot of the grassroots organizations like There Is No Limit Foundation that work daily to help empower our communities. Young people need to be empowered, period especially adolescents, because they can become conduits for actually ending a lot of the practices that are causing harm in their communities, but also they could help teach the younger generation and they could also help teach the older generation. So really they are the bridge between the two and we have to empower them and make sure that their voices are heard. In my opening remarks, I mentioned that 4.6 million girls will continue to be at risk annually until 2030, unless we do more. That's 4.6 million too many girls. 4.6 million futures that we cannot afford to lose or neglect. 4.6 million futures that can exponentially have ramifications on our world. 4.6 million voices, dreams, people that need the support and that need to be protected. So again, I'm going to call on more political will to end this practice everywhere where it is practiced. And I also want to make sure that we add more protective laws because if we don't close the loopholes in the laws that we have, we will continue to see that laws will be there, but the practice will continue. And I call on better collaboration between and among civil society. We have to share knowledge. We have to pull our resources together and we have to lead with unified voices. And on our side that there is no limit foundation, we are proud to be initiating our roots of the future projects that will be happening in the United States and focusing on diaspora communities. We want to be able to provide support around issues such as FGM, FGM, but also to bring these issues on college campuses in high school and middle schools and elementary schools, because the United States also has its own issues. And that's why we wanted to really bring Caitlin into this conversation as well. So we we'll really look forward to being able to work and make that happen. And I'm really, really proud that in Guinea, we have actually built a center that is going to focus on human rights and entrepreneurship. And we'll be announcing that uh, a little bit more in detail very soon. But this center is going to be a hub where we are going to be teaching all of the learnings that we have for more than a decade about ending female genital mutilation and promoting human rights. And we will be welcoming any of you to come there and to learn alongside us. Again, female genital mutilation must not be seen as a siloed issue. We have to see it as a baseline issue that opens the door for more violence against women. And we have to see it as an issue of human rights because unless we do, we're going to be here in 10, 15, 20, 30 years, still talking about the fact that we need to end this practice. So let's work together. Let's roll up our sleeves and let's get it done. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. And I think this concludes our event. So thank you and have a wonderful day. Take care.